Thank you, Lexi. We're excited that Boys and Girls Club, Girls Club rejoins so we can help you on your mission. Okay, now to introduce today's uh, main presenter, Mr. Arthur Miller is responsible for the largest electric utility in Alaska, serving over 91,000 members and more than 113,000 service locations. In his more than three decades at Chugach, Mr. Miller has held several key, key positions prior to being named CEO. He has an extent, extensive experience in the industry and played a key role in the 2020 acquisition of Municipal Light and Power by Chugach. Miller has a master's in economics from the University of Wyoming and a bachelor's in business from Colorado State University. Please help me welcome Arthur Miller. Well, thank you very much. It really is an honor to be here this, this afternoon. And I really appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on Chugach Electric Association and our, our priority areas as an organization as well as to touch on some of the transformational issues that are occurring in the electric utility industry, which really provides significant opportunities for electric utilities. Also, uh, before we get started, I want to mention that we did place a sustainability report on each table. And if you're interested in seeing um, that in electronic form, we also have that posted on our, on our website. I also would like to recognize two of our board members that are here in attendance this afternoon. Director Sam Kaysen is our board chair and Director Mark Wigan. The Chugach board is extremely dedicated in advancing our short and long-term interests of the association. And we really are fortunate to have a very progressive board of directors. Before discussing our priority areas and the future direction of energy in Alaska, I'll provide a short background on the Alaska Rail Belt and some background information on Chugach Electric itself. The Rail Belt is comprised of primarily four electric cooperatives and one municipal utility. The four cooperatives are shown here, but starting with Golden Valley Electric Association in Fairbanks, Matanuska Electric Association in the Palmer Wasilla area, shown in yellow, Chugach Electric, shown in the dark blue, Homer Electric Association in the purple. And the one municipal utility in the rail belt is Seward Electric System, shown on the very bottom in, in, on the chart in dark green. The electric corridor that interconnects all the utilities together is referred to as the rail belt electric system. And the rail belt transmission lines follow the, basically the Alaska Railroad from Fairbanks all the way down to Seward. And then the transmission lines extend uh, westward to Homer and then further down south to the Bradley Lake Hydroelectric Project. In total, we have about 700 miles of transmission line that interconnects all the utilities together. However, importantly, we are an isolated system. We're not interconnected with the lower 48 and we're not interconnected with Canada. We operate entirely independent from both Canada and the rest of the uh, lower 48 states. Some background information, a unique aspect about power generation in Anchorage is that one of the very first major power sources came from a ship called Sackett's Harbor. The ship actually served in the U.S. Merchant Marine during World War II, but in 1946, the ship broke in half about 800 miles south of the Aleutian chain. The bow of the ship sank, but the stern didn't, and ultimately was towed to Anchorage, where it served as the major, first major power source and, and providing power from 1946 to 1955. In 1955, Sackett's Harbor was replaced by the Eklutna Hydroelectric Project, which continues to generate power today for both Chugach and Matanuska Electric Association. Chugach has been in existence for about 75 years, incorporated as a not-for-profit electric cooperative in 1948. And since our beginning, we have continued to add generation to meet our ongoing power requirements throughout our service area. In fact, most of the generation plants that were commissioned many, many years ago are still operational today, although we've made significant improvements and efficiencies on these generation units. 
In 2016, we acquired a working interest in the Beluga River unit gas field to meet a portion of our gas requirements for generation. In fact, from 2016 through 2022, we have saved over $70 million due to our direct ownership in the gas field. And today, about 60% of our gas requirements are met through our direct ownership interest in this field. In 2020, we acquired Anchorage Municipal Light and Power, which provided electric service to the downtown areas of Anchorage and the Central Business District of Anchorage at an estimated, well, at an approximate value of just under a billion dollars. The acquisition has increased our metered service from just over 81,000 customer accounts to over 113,000. We've also increased the number of employees at Chugach from about 260 to about 450. Today, we are a much stronger and more efficient electric utility as a result of the combined operations of Chugach and MLMP. What hasn't changed in all these years is our focus on safety. Safety remains the number one priority of Chugach. In fact, it's an unwavering core value of the association. We're committed to providing a culture of safety for our employees, our members, contractors, and really the public at large through training, proactively identifying and communicating hazards and looking out for the safety of others. We strive for a zero incident workplace and our safety program is designed to provide effective and tr uh, training and tracking tools to safe, ensure safety protocols are met 24-7, 365 days out of the year and incorporated into the, our, our daily work practices day in and day out. As background on Chugach, we're the largest electric utility in the state. We provide electric service to about one in three Alaskans. We serve the majority of the municipality of Anchorage, Girdwood, Whittier, Cooper Landing, Moose Pass, Tionic, Beluga, and Hope. As I mentioned, we are very unique with our uh, two thirds working interest in the Beluga River field. We're one of the very few uh, utilities in the nation that has a direct ownership in a gas field. And Chugach owns two thirds of the Beluga River unit with Hill Corp Alaska owning the remaining one third. We also are the 13th largest electric cooperative in the country based on uh, asset, total asset value. And in the state of Alaska, we're the 15th largest based on revenue for companies that are 51% or more Alaska owned and, and have operations in the state. In 2022, our generation mix was approximately 82% natural gas, 15% hydroelectric power, and about 3% wind. These numbers can fluctuate from year to year depending on energy sales and environmental factors, such as the availability of hydro for our generation resources, and also how often the wind um, and the differences in the uh, wind um, and the capacity factors uh, resulting from uh, changes in wind velocities and frequency during the year, but also maintenance on our generation and transmission systems have a direct impact in getting, making sure that we have access to um, these natural or these resources on our system. Importantly, we're continuing to look for opportunities to reduce our reliance on natural gas. And I'll talk more about this in a little bit. But right now, we're evaluating several utility scale wind and solar projects, uh, including uh, hydro as well, but in a way that does not have a material adverse or negative impact on electric rate levels. In general, in the state of Alaska, at least in the, along the rail belt utilities, the cost of renewables is generally higher than our current cost structure. But this is likely to change as we look into the future. And we'll talk about this in a little bit with our gas supply situation and the challenges that the uh, rebel utilities are facing uh, in recognition of supply constraints coming out of the Cook Inlet Basin. We know that our members are always watching electric rates and we are continuing to work to keep them as low as possible. 
As you can see from this slide, Chugach is, has the lowest rates in the rail belt, and it's been that way for several years. We do still have north and south district rates, and this is re really the result of the acquisition of MLMP. But as you'll hear a little bit later, this will begin to change in our upcoming rate case. As members invest in energy efficiency, our load growth, however, has been negative. We have been dropping on average about 1% a year on energy sales due to energy conservation efforts. Also, uh, most recently during impacts uh, with downturns in the local economy. Rather than increasing rates to recover these declines, we have historically worked very hard to keep rates stable as much as possible. We are, Chugach is governed by a seven member board of directors who are dedicated and work extremely hard to ensure reliability, low cost and excellent service in a continue advancing our strategic priority areas as an organization. Each year we meet and to review and update our strategic priority areas and where necessary make changes in our overall strategic direction. Our current plan has seven priority areas which you can see on the screen. Among them is the continued integration of Chugach and MLMP also, the natural gas supply considerations as we move forward and decarbonization. As all of this is happening, Chugach is focused on ways to lower its overall cost structure. It really is part of everything that we do as an organization. The fundamental purpose of acquiring Anchorage Municipal Light and Power was to provide a lower overall cost structure to, in the provision of electric service. We recognized that it was cheaper for our members and for the customers in Anchorage that if electric service were provided by a single utility rather than two separate distinct utilities. How has it gone? The acquisition has been hands down a resounding success. We have transitioned into a larger and significantly stronger organization with savings between our closing date of October of 2020 through 2022 of over $72 million as a result of the acquisition. The electric utility industry is extremely capital intensive and the acquisition and the, and the consolidation of our two organizations has allowed us to increase efficiencies through economies of scale and avoid and eliminate duplications really across every facet of utility operations, generation, transmission, distribution, and customer service related activities. In fact, just on fuel cost alone, as a result of the acquisition, we are saving about $800,000 a month. And those savings translate into a direct reduction in the cost levels that we have to recover from, from you, our members. Of course, none of this is possible without our employees. And with the combining of the former MLMP and Chugach workforces, we have outstanding, accomplished, and experienced employees. It is really their hard work and motivation that keeps Chugach moving forward. And I'm very appreciative and thankful for the many talented people we have working at our organization. We are also focused on bringing our employees together on a single campus. Last year, the Chugach Board of Directors approved the One Campus Plan. The One Campus Plan involves retrofitting our existing operations building and building a new building on our South Campus. And the new building will house not only our engineering team, but it will provide an additional 27 bays uh, for our equipment. Following the acquisition of MLMP, we really have been operating on two campuses, the North Campus, which is a legacy MLMP campus, and the Chugach Campus, or the South Campus, I mean the, um, the other side, of, or the other campus that we've been operating on. And in this effort to consolidate our, or unify, if you will, the workforces, it will allow the, the transfer of about 165 employees from the North Campus to the South Campus and our, allow us to really continue to realize additional efficiencies resulting from the consolidation 
of the two organizations. We also think that in addition to uh, in productivity gains, there will be improvements uh, in safety, and it will also allow for the un a greater unification of the two cultures of, the, of both organizations. Construction on this project began earlier this year, and final completion is expected in the third quarter of 2025. Incidentally, we did, uh, in our putting on solar panels, um, you really can't tell with this picture, but there's uh, about 175 to 200 kilowatts of solar panels will be installed uh, that will be used to provide station service uh, for our buildings. A significant challenge facing Chugach and really the Railbelt utilities is natural gas supply. Last year, Hillcorp Alaska announced that they would not be renewing existing contracts under similar terms and conditions under, that, that each utility has under contract with Hillcorp, and ultimately, additional sources of gas supply are needed. For Chugach, our contract expires at the end of first quarter of 2028. This chart shows the supply of natural gas, which is shown in the blue um, columns, and that's compared to the gas demand shown on the horizontal green line. Beginning in first quarter of 2028, you can see that the supply of natural gas falls below the demand for natural gas. One thing this graph does not show is that we do expect that that horizontal line, our gas demand line, will decrease through time as we put on new clean energy technologies on the system although this graph does not show that. The real question that Chugach is facing and the other utilities are facing is how do we fill the gap between supply and demand as we move forward? That is, for Chugach, our requirements are fully met through 2027, but in first, after first quarter of 2028, we have the supply-demand imbalance. And when we look at this, we recognize that a critical decision is going to have to be made either by the end of this year or early next year on which direction that we take. There's no question we have to be prudent in our decision-making process. Once a decision is made on a direction to take, we are committing to a path that requires significant capital investment. No question we are pursuing clean energy when economic. We're currently looking at hydro. We're looking at additional wind, additional solar to put onto the Chugach system. We also are following very closely and working with the Alaska, uh, Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, or AGDC, for LNG uh, export, which would meet all the utility needs, not only in South Central Alaska, but certainly in interior Alaska as well. And they have an estimate, they have provided an estimated price of natural gas of between four and five dollars in MCF if that project were to move forward. Today, our current cook and lit gas price averages between seven dollars and fifty cents approximately and eight dollars and fifty cents in MCF. So a significant benefit on this gas pipeline. However, that will take several years if once a decision is made for that to go forward. Furthermore, the balance sheets of the, all the utilities combined cannot support the construction of the gas pipeline. Uh, an in-state line is approximately 10 to $13 billion, and a gas line used for LNG export is approximately $40 billion. So uh, we're gonna have to have um, additional decision-making it's going to have to be made that will allow the utilities to take advantage of, pro of that project. We clearly do not have uh, the financial means by which we can um, advance a project of that nature. For Chugach, we also have our direct ownership in the Beluga River unit gas field. And we work collaboratively with Hillcorp Alaska and, and working on maximizing the, the benefit of that gas field. In fact, last year we drilled four wells. This year we have five wells planned. And we're looking forward uh, to continue maximizing the utilization of that resource. And, and, uh, but that resource does have a limited life. Uh, right now we are expecting the gas field will uh, be fully economically depleted by 2033 unless additional discoveries are found. 
We're also evaluating LNG imports or liquefied natural gas imports. Um, that really would be gas coming from the world markets or Canada for importation into uh, South Central Alaska. There's two study efforts that are under, being undertaken right now. One is the Raubelt Utility Working Group and another uh, that Chugach is working on uh, directly is a separate evaluation um, and looking at it in recognition of, of our unique um, situation. What do I mean by our unique? Because of our ownership interest in the Beluga River unit and then we also have a, a working uh, capacity uh, contractual arrangement for gas storage in Cook Inlet. Uh, we're differently positioned than the other utilities and we're evaluating what options to be taken as well. Um, so th that's, there'll be additional information that are coming out on, on the evaluation of LNG imports uh, fairly soon. The one thing that's really important that I think often gets lost when we talk about the transition in energy, and that's electric storage and gas storage, or storage, energy storage in general. Whether we get gas on a going forward basis from the North Slope through a gas pipeline, or whether we get gas through LNG imports, we are gonna need significantly greater gas storage capabilities available to the utilities in South Central Alaska. It's gonna, it will be essential as we move forward. Another aspect though, that we are uh, also in greater need of is electric storage or battery energy storage systems. Uh, that allow us to integrate renewables better, provide greater efficiencies on the system. Those technologies continue to improve, and I'll talk more about that briefly in a, in a little bit. Part of our approval from the Regulatory Commission of Alaska on the acquisition of uh, MLMP was to file a general rate case in 2023, which we actually expect to file by the end of this week. Chugach's base rates, which provide the recovery of the fixed cost, primarily associated with the provision of electric service, have not been adjusted in years. In fact, with the acquisition of MLMP, MLMP's base rates had not been have not been adjusted since 2017, and Chugach's legacy service area not since 2020. And like all businesses, we have had inflationary impacts and supply chain disruptions that have really put an upward pressure on cost on our cost structure. We have also experienced, as I mentioned, declines in sales due to energy efficiency measures and also impacts from the economy. In addition, however, to adjusting rates to recover our costs, we are also going to be advocating for the transition to rate unification between the legacy service areas of MLMP and Chugach, that is the North and the South District, and, and start the transition to achieve unified rates between the two service areas. We are also looking at time of use rates in, a, in, a, in the context that will help advance beneficial electrification, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. Really, Time of use rates provide the opportunity to, to provide consumers or members of our system to use electricity in a way that's beneficial, not only for the Chugat system, but for the member as well. If we can have shift load into off-peak periods with electric vehicle charging as an example, that means we don't have to put in as much capital or infrastructure to meet the increases in load resulting from these other technologies. In addition to that, we are going to be working on developing a cruise ship interconnection uh, tariff onto the Chugat system, which really will help us help the cruise ships that come into Whittier, which currently now run on primarily diesel gen uh, generation, uh, to interconnect with the Chugat system, which will have a positive environmental impact on the community of Whittier. We are also been moving forward to remove the demand ratchet from the legacy service area of MLMP customers. And this is something that many of MLMP's uh, historical large commercial customers have wanted. We have committed to removing this condition from our operating tariff. We're also committing to, to examine new and innovative rate designs as we go forward. 
The rate changes will likely be implemented in two phases. We are requesting an interim rate increase effective September 1 of this year, which on an overall system average basis would increase retail customer bills by about 3.6 percent. In addition to that, we are proposing a permanent rate change effective uh, estimated effective date of September of 2024 that will result in an increase on customer bills by about 5.9 percent. Importantly, these, are, these rate changes are not additive, but rather they're in relationship to today's rates. So what we are looking at on an overall system basis, once the full adjudication period uh, of the filing has been uh, finalized, the overall increase in rates would be about 5.9%, um, taken basically in two tranches, 3.6% in September of this year with the remaining balance in September of next year. Without the acquisition, there is no question these rate changes would have been significantly higher. On a total customer bill impact basis, it's important to look at each individual customer class of service. They are different. And when you bring two legacy service areas together where rates have been calculated under different rate designs and different cost of service structures, different cost structures and different load characteristics, you, when you bring the rates together, you get different impacts on a customer class basis. What these percentages show is that what is the overall impact to a residential customer bill when you look at it as a combined system? So residential is 7%, a small commercial 8.9%, large general service secondary 4.4%, and large general service primary of 8.3%. All rates, however, must be and are subject to final approval by the Regulatory Commission of Alaska. I want to talk briefly about the changes that are occurring in the electric utility industry. The utility industry is undergoing really transformational changes in three fundamental areas that really provide, in an essence, tremendous opportunity for electric utilities. And these change drivers are decarbonization, decentralization of the power grid, and technology advancements. When I talk about decarbonization, that really means the reduction in carbon. The Chugach Board of Directors last year set minimum uh, goals to reduce our carbon emissions by at least 35% by 2030 and by at least 50% by 2040 without having a negative material impact on rate levels. We really see decarbonization happening on two fronts the supply side or the utility side and the demand side or the consumer side. On the utility side, we see challenges as well as opportunities. The challenges specifically is introducing renewable generation that changes our cost structure and really also related to the transitioning to clean energy itself. That is, how do we transition away from our existing generation resources or our existing generation assets where we have about 700 million dollars of generation plant invested to clean energy technologies and how do we do this transition without having a significant negative material impact on rates we certainly do not want to have stranded assets there are also limitations on our ability to regulate intermittent renewables with gas fired generation Certainly the, the wind does not always blow, the sun does not always shine. The battery technology that we have today is not enough to fill in the gaps uh, when, when we don't have power generated from renewable technology. So we need to look at ways and how we can change the system to be able to accommodate those types of technologies. We certainly are moving forward with utility scale projects. We're evaluating a utility scale wind project, 120 megawatts in a utility scale solar project of 120 megawatts to add our goal to increase our renewable generation by 100,000 megawatt hours over the next several years. 
these efforts um, are ongoing and they'll continue and our doors are always open for uh, independent power producers or other inter interested parties to advance renewable projects onto our system. On the customer side, we have expanded uh, through our operating tariff, our net metering tariff to increase uh, really the number of eligible customers that would be under the, that are eligible to uh, put in their own generation uh, at their residence or business. And today we have over 700 accounts that have renewable generation um, at their place of business or their, at their residence. The vast majority of these installations are solar installations and the vast majority of those installations are on residential accounts. A uh, fairly small number of, of commercial accounts, very few wind projects on our system right now, actually about four um, under our net metering tariff. So very limited at this point. Another significant opportunity relates to beneficial electrification. And the significant opportunities are associated with beneficial electrification in the context of moving away from fossil fuel use in a way that reduces emissions, but also uh, reduces energy costs. And these opportunities continue to increase and include electric vehicles, heat pumps, electric bikes, chainsaws, lawnmowers, snowblowers, and other types of tools and equipment. In fact, I can tell you um, it's uh, as a owner of a battery operated lawnmower, it works fantastic. There's no more spilling gas. Um, there's no spark plug change. There's no oil change at the end of every season. Uh, it works tremendously well, much easier. Uh, and then when I'm done, all I do is plug in the battery and wait until I need the, the lawn needs to be mowed again. Very easy. At Chugach, we've also uh, purchased several battery operated snow blowers that we have located over at our Beluga power plant across Cook Inlet. And the feedback that I'm getting from our operators over there has been nothing but positive uh, results on, on the operation of those um, technologies. We also have several programs uh, to advance beneficial electrification. One is heat pumps. We put in uh, a program earlier this year where residential members may receive an incentive of, of, of up to 15% uh, or $900 toward the total cost of a uh, approved um, heat pump. And then on the commercial side, uh, small commercial up to 15% or $1,500 for that type of an, an installation. On electric vehicle charging, we have a similar program for customers to put in uh, electric vehicle chargers, uh, depending on whether you're at home or you're, you're a business. We have $200 for residential customers, $1,000 for level two chargers, which really is basically a 220 volt. And then we also have uh, up to $5,000 for a level three charger, which is a 400, up to 480 uh, volts for charging, which those would not be a, uh, your, a residence. They'd be really in a, uh, a business or a commercial entity that provides charging to the general public. On top of this, we also established a special electrical, electric vehicle charging tariff uh, last year that removes barriers to fast charging, really to, to level three. What happens with electric vehicle charging is because the electric usage patterns are very sporadic. It's either, you know, the consumption is really, really low, but then it shoots up when you do a fast charger and resulting in a very high average electric rate. And we took the barriers off of those uh, operating tariffs to make it easier for businesses to offer this type of service uh, to the general public. And this was really done through a collaborated, collaborated work effort with the Regulatory Commission of Alaska and the other utilities. Beneficial electrification is really a win-win-win proposition. It reduces costs to the consumer. It reduces the impact on the environment, reduces carbon emissions, and properly structured from an electric utility perspective it reduces electric rates through greater utilization of the electric system. That is, if we can get businesses and households to shift energy consumption away from non-peak periods, that means we can utilize our system in a much more efficient manner than we could if everybody plugged in their electric vehicles at six o'clock in the evening, Monday through Friday, 
which would cause us to have to add additional infrastructure uh, to meet the additional load. On average, an electric vehicle adds about 50% of a, a typical uh, residential household electric consumption. It's still cheaper, however, than uh, buying gasoline at the, at the gas pump. The second area of significant change is decentralization of the power grid or the transition from a highly centralized utility owned generation structure to really distributed generation either owned by the utility or the consumer. And this transformation is really the result of new technologies such as rooftop solar and energy storage. And we're now certainly gonna be seeing energy storage capabilities with electric vehicles. Decentralization, it really, it really, it adds complexity to the operation of the grid, but it also allows customers to generate their own power for their own needs with continuous interconnection under the grid to ensure uh, reliability of electric service. Tied directly to decarbonization and decentralization is technological change. Changes in technology are leading to changes in the way that we do business. The electric system is becoming increasingly complex and we now have the ability to operate in the system and we will continue to advance, make advancements and investments on technology to increase efficiencies on the system in a manner that increases the connectivity and the communication between the utility and the consumer resulting in greater efficiencies and options for customers. And we look forward uh, to continuing to make capital investments as the industry moves further and further into this direction. Moving forward, as our industry is changing, along with changes in member expectations, Chugach Electric is not standing still. We continually look for ways to add clean energy into our generation mix. We're currently studying renewable and clean energy technologies, wind, solar, hydro. We also support investments in transmission uh, and generation infrastructure, as we know that a reliable system, bulk power system, transmission system, is essential to integrating renewables and clean energy technologies, not only for today, but for the long-term future of Alaska. We also know there's a lot, and we are following and submitting applications for grant funding opportunities, uh, both at the transmission and the generation level. That Those efforts are ongoing and will be ongoing for several years. And as I mentioned before, energy storage is essential as we move forward. Chugach and Matanuska Electric Association uh, jointly purchased a, a battery electric uh, storage system uh, that's uh, currently in the process of being installed at our south campus. It's a 40 megawatt uh, system. We expect it to be uh, fully commercially operational by fourth quarter of next year. That the battery system will allow us to reduce our fuel cost where we can rely on these battery technologies uh, to operate the system more efficiently. It will increase reliability on our system and it will also allow us to integrate renewables in a much more efficient way than what we are able to do so today. We're continuing to look at expanding our, our footprint with battery operated technology as we move forward. We remain committed on our vision of responsibly developing energy to build a clean, sustainable future for Alaska. We recognize, however, that permanent and meaningful change does not happen overnight. There is no silver bullet and solutions will necessarily be multifaceted, driven by new cleaner generation technologies supported by policy developments. There's a lot of work ahead of us that we need to do, but the future is very exciting and really opportunistic. We never lose sight of our members or the community to ensure that we provide safe, reliable, and affordable electric service. Thank you very much for this opportunity to provide you an update on Chugach Electric and the direction of our industry. Thank you, Arthur. Okay, I think you actually covered a few of the questions, so I'll just do a couple here, we have time. 
Um, in terms of workforce development, um, can you tell us a little bit about your linemen, folks working in your clean energy facility? Um, what are your needs? What is the future and who can help you? Is, this, is that on? Yeah. <laughs> so we are, uh, as an organization, we are looking at Chugach as an, as, as an entire organization to advance our interest on sustainability. And in fact, in 2017, the Board of Directors um, identified sustainability or the triple bottom line, uh, where we have a focus of uh, really people, planet, uh, and uh, financial considerations. And our activities and what we do has those three factors as the underlying basis on our performance as an organization. And uh, right now, I would say we're still in the, in, in the, in the uh, transformational process as an organization following the acquisition of MLMP in 2020. And we'll continue advancing uh, Chugach as an organization, recognizing those fundamental uh, basis as we move forward. I also look at from a cultural perspective, from Chugach's perspective, we're transitioning into really a human-centric or employee-centric organization. And that transformation will take several years uh, to uh, change, but that will be front and center as we move forward. Thank you. We have a couple questions about the renewable portfolio standard. Um, can you maybe just comment on that and how uh, it would change your opposition to it? I don't know that uh, Chugach has been uh, publicly stating that in, any, in any way, shape, or form its opposition to it. As I mentioned earlier, Chugach Electric has a goal, a decarbonization goal, to uh, reduce our carbon footprint uh, by at least 35 percent by 2040 and at least 50 percent by 2050. Clean energy is a much broader is a broader concept than a, re a renewable portfolio standard or renewable generation. So when, I, when we talk about renewables, that's a derivative or a subset of decarbonization. So what, what, the way we look at uh, the environment as we go forward and our impacts, we want a broader view um, on that. That is, there's more impacts that we can have on the environment than just renewable generation. There's other aspects of our business that we want to support. We want to support electric vehicles. Uh, that's a decarbonization effort. We want to support energy efficiency. At, uh, that's a decarbonization effort. So it's a broader footprint and a broader way of looking at the industry. There's no question that uh, renewable energy is, is part of that equation um, as we look to the future. So the, the, the Renewable Portfolio Standard was put forth uh, earlier this year. It will be part of the legislative session uh, and will be addressed in the upcoming session. And we expect there'll be uh, meetings and sessions held during the summer months. And Chugach looks forward to working with the parties as we work our way through um, that process. We wanna make sure that our member interests are, are upheld uh, throughout that process. Great. And last question, how will importing LNG impact member rates and how is this impact being considered in economic decisions today? Very good question. So um, on all indications, electric rates, if we have to import LNG will increase and that impact will be different depending on which utility um, that you, you, you ask. It also is gonna be really a function of what price that we're gonna get on the world market um, those impacts are being, you know, in the process of being evaluated um, right now. So I don't have a direct answer on the on the rate impact at this juncture. Um, I think we will know quite a bit more uh, and be able to have public statements um, regarding those efforts in the very near future. Um, I think I will leave it there. Great. Well, thanks again. And if any of you have questions, I'm sure um, both uh, Arthur and Lexi will be available uh, after the forum. So uh, just a few announcements. Thanks again for coming today. Next week, July 3rd, we will not have a forum in observance of Independence Day. Hopefully the sun will shine for us for 4th of July. Fingers crossed. We'll return on July 10th with the national speaker, Dr. Gleb Sipersky, on how to use hybrid work to improve productivity and retention while cutting costs. Uh, that's here at the Dedina. And then on the 17th, we'll be at the Petroleum Club of Anchorage 
where Shiloh Community Housing will present on how they plan to disrupt the cycle of homelessness. Uh, so please be sure to register for Make It Mondays on the Thursday prior by 5 p.m. And if you'd like to submit a proposal for your business to present, we are filling in our fall and winter schedules. So just reach out to me or submit a proposal at anchoragechamber.org.